Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a mighty man of wealth and of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered, said, It's the Moabitess damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And he said, I pray you, let me... And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have, not, have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art a thirst, go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. And she fell on her face, bowed herself to the ground, and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath, been fully, it hath fully been showed unto me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the God, Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Now, if you come in late, we, we read uh, just briefly, and by late I mean a minute late. No, it's actually eight after, so not, not, too, much, not too late. Uh, but we just read in uh, Kings... In uh, chapter 11, the, the account of Bathsheba and Samuel. David. Samuel. And Samuel, I'm sorry. Thanks, guys. Uh, for the record. Not that it won't make any difference because I'll say it wrong again in a little bit. I'm trying to find my location there again. Okay, so we, we read about David's encounter with Bathsheba. And I would like today, in our series on biblical femininity in our series on biblical masculinity to talk about appropriate behavior. Talk about appropriate behavior to draw a contrast between the behavior of David with Bathsheba and the behavior with Boaz and, uh, and Ruth. Now we know the connection, don't we? We know the connection of Obed being David's grandfather and of course being that Obed being that offspring of Boaz and Ruth. And so there's quite a connection. So uh, here uh, we see some differences. You tell me some differences between David and Boaz. Boaz was working, David wasn't. Okay. Did he say? Boaz worked, David didn't. It isn't to say, we're not saying David didn't know how to work. Or that David... Uh, wasn't good at his work. But there is a big difference between what Boaz was doing and what David was doing. Uh, David was physically able to get off his couch and get around. He was physically able to court a woman who was another man's wife, and so he would have been physically capable of doing as the kings do and go out to war. Um, we know the story of Uriah, don't we, when David tried to get him to go home and take his leisure. And Uriah said, hey, listen, the other guys are out. Their life is in peril. They're, they're, they're doing without. I'm not going to be at home uh, living with the benefits of marriage while those guys are being deprived. And he slept at the king's, he, he slept at the king's doorstep waiting on the king. He said, the king wants me here. I'm here. But uh, I want to perform and do my duty as a man. Okay, so that's a contrast between Uriah, I suppose, and David. Boaz, uh, let, let's talk about their status. Let's talk about their importance. Uh, obviously, David was king, and as such, he would have been fairly wealthy. wealthy. Uh, Boaz is described as landowner. What? He's a landowner. He's a landowner, but what else? He would be a wealthy landowner because his mother was allowed to bring whatever 
to Israel, uh, her relatives and her whatever they had to Israel. So whatever she had in wealth or whatever was brought into Israel, and then when they settled, yeah, we down, would surmise that, but it, but it seems as though he was also into purchasing land as well. So he would have grown his wealth. Um, but the 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 first verse of chapter two says he was a mighty man of wealth. David would have been described as a man of valor or a mighty man, mighty man. Boaz would have been described as a mighty man. Okay, so there's no questioning the masculinity of these two guys, if you will, right? In other words, there's, there's no questioning that, that David uh, stood out among his peers. There's no question as well that, that uh, Boaz did as well. But when it came to personal integrity, there was rather grave a question. Is Boaz his grandfather? Yes. Uh, what have been, I mean, the, the, the conclusion of Ruth is that, uh, let's see, Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife, and when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. But the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher. And in verse 16, or verse 17, the woman, her and the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, there is a son born to Naomi that they call his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. So Obed would be David's grandfather, and Boaz would be his great-grandfather. So that would be the, the history behind that. So relatives. Uh, David had pretty good background, didn't he? You know, he talked about being from Bethlehem, being a small town, you know, and that sort of thing, not being a prominent city and so forth. But the reality of it is, is that when it came to background, his great-grandfather was Boaz. And uh, this is inspired, God-given lineage. And so David comes from pretty good stock, comes from pretty good background. Uh, Ruth was a Moabitess. And here's a, something that uh, I think is interesting. Uriah was one of David's mighty men, described as one of David's mighty men. And so when David became king in Israel, Uriah would have been someone of importance. Uh, his house was located in proximity to the palace think about that. He lived in the same neighborhood David did. Close enough to the palace that David saw his wife uh, when she was in a state of undress. And so uh, Uriah would have been a man of some importance and some means. Uh, with regard to masculinity, there's no question that uh, David was a masculine man, distinctively masculine man. So was Boaz. With regard to femininity, there's no question that Bathsheba was very feminine. Uh, but so was Ruth. But I want to look at their behaviors and I want to contrast the two because just because you act because you, you, you are masculine or just because you're feminine doesn't mean you're a gentleman or a lady. And I think that's a major difference. I understand God forgives. I understand there's, there, that the past, what you are in the past, can be changed in the future. And the truth of the matter is, though, what you are, if it's good, can also be changed in the future toward evil, toward bad. There's a lot of confusion, surprisingly, in our culture because we've lost moral absolutism. Moral absolutism is based upon the idea that God has an opinion and His opinion is absolute and it's absolutely right or wrong what God says. David, the problem with David, the thing that really gets me about David is that the man uh, was not without a knowledge of who God was and what God wanted. It's interesting when you read the laws, when you read the law that God gave, that literally one of the provisions in the law was that Israel, you're not supposed to have a king, but if you do have a king, don't have a king that has many wives, that has multiple wives. And David had had a wife. Who was David's wife, his legitimate wife? 
Michael. Yeah, McCall, Michelle, Michelle, however you want to pronounce her name. That was his wife. And um, things didn't go well in that relationship, did they? Oh, what was the cause? What was the problem? Saul took her away. Saul took her away from him. Okay, now let's analyze that for a second, <clears throat> shall we? Do you really think Saul took her away? Let's talk about it. Let's think about it for a minute. She was jealous because David danced before the Lord. That was later on, now. Well, after she'd been married to him for so many later. years, the other guy. Um, we're talking about when she's still married to David, when he danced with the women, or when he danced, and she basically said, "You know, you're acting like a fool out there," you know, and she kind of disrespected him. There was a. Uh, would you say that David? had a functional relationship with his wife, a respectful relationship. Do you think that Michael loved David? I think so. Do you think David loved Michael? I think so. You know one of the problems with their relationship was? <laughs> David respected her status, I believe, more than he did her person. She was the king's daughter. And he was very overawed by that fact. He was very humbled, if you will, that Saul even offered, you know, when they said, hey, you know, the king's daughter's being offered if you go slay Philistines. And uh, David's like, well, who am I that I'd marry the king's daughter? I think every Christian ought to grasp this and get this, and it'll help you when you do. God's not a respecter of persons, and we oughtn't to be either. It's very interesting that... that um, Boaz is a mighty man of valor. And Ruth is not even really Jewish. She's from she's from Moab. So she's got, you know, she's got some background. She comes from Lot's daughters. And that's kind of a terrible heritage, actually, if you think about your pedigree. And yet when Boaz sees her in his field. He says, who is that? Who is she? Uh, the culture of the day would have said for Boaz, don't let her around here. You can do better than this. And yet Boaz really treats her as a person. He's a mighty man of valor. Here's something interesting about Boaz as well. Uh, the next kinsman didn't want to be married to her because it would have marred his children's inheritance, which meant he was already married. But Boaz wasn't. And yet in his fields, Boaz has maidens working there. Uh, they're not necessarily his servants, but they might be. But they're gleaning. He has his gleaners, his workers, that are doing the harvest. You know the, you know the, the way the Lord had provided, right? Uh, you had the right, the poor, or the people who weren't landowners, had the right to come in behind the reapers, and when reapers reap, they weren't supposed to harvest the corner of the field. In other words, here, maybe the guy's got a scythe or, scythe or whatever, and he's going like this. He's not allowed to get in the corner and really work the corners of the field. <clears throat> and a generous man would just, you know, just stay way away from it. Just say, well, you know, I'll just let the folks that need it have that. And uh, that God had promised blessing for the landowners if they, that was the way in Israel to take care of the poor. The poor, they didn't harvest for the poor and say, now. You know, stay at home and we'll do the work and here's something to eat, stay out of our way. The poor had to come out and, and harvest. But they had a harvest that was theirs. When they would shake a tree to get the fruit off of it, they couldn't come back and shake it again later. You waited until everything was ripe, you shook it good, and then whatever was left there was for the poor. So if it came a little later, or if it didn't come off at the first shake, at the first gleaning, then you know that was that was for the poor. So, Naomi, I'm not sorry, Ruth, the Bible says her hap was to light on the field of Boaz. So, it was a coincidence, it was a circumstance, I don't believe it was planned, although the language could be made to be a little bit of a, ha <laughs> you know, she happened to light on uh, his field. But, uh, it's interesting, Boaz's response to her, he said, I've told the young man, what did he tell his young men? Not to touch her. Don't you touch her. 
Now, if you study and you look at it closely, actually, I believe that was a standing order for Boaz's young men regarding ladies in his field. I think it's rather interesting that there were other maidens in Boaz's field. And I think it's rather interesting as well that Ruth happened to go there to go there as well. And I think it was because it was a safe place. Yes? I was going to say, maybe he was saying, don't pick on her because she's different. Well, I, yeah, I don't think so, though. I think it had to do with, you know, don't take liberties with the less fortunate. In other words, these ladies are vulnerable because of their lot in life, because of their circumstances, and it would be very easy for these men who are reapers to take advantage of them. And that seems to be, that seems to be the, uh, the, the idea here. And I, I think here we find a major contrast between David and Boaz. David was in a position to take advantage, and he did. Boaz was in a position to take advantage, and he not only did not, but he also kept those who were subordinate to him from doing the same. And here we find a major area of character. Man, let me just make a statement to you, and, and uh, I don't, don't want to go overboard in making it, but a man does not take liberties, even if he could. I'm talking about a man who is biblically masculine does not take liberties even if he could. And ladies, I'm going to just tell you something. A man who will take liberties if he can will not do so exclusively. What I mean by that is if, he, if a man will have a physical relationship with a woman before she's his wife, he'll have a physical relationship with any woman before she's his wife. I'll say that again because it's very true. A man who will have a physical relationship with a woman before she's his wife, will have a physical relationship with any woman, whether or not she's his wife. I don't want to point to our current politics to illustrate that, but it does so rather well, doesn't it? The fact of the matter is that a godly Christian man has integrity. And he does not use his wealth or his position to influence a relationship. He doesn't use his wealth or his position to influence a relationship. And the underlying truth here, ladies and gentlemen, is that if all people are the same, then you meet on the basis of who you are as a person, not on the basis of power or control. Certainly Ruth very easily could have come under the power or control of Boaz. Both because she was a Moabitess, but also because she is a single lady and really didn't have any kind of protection. And Boaz provided that for her even though he wasn't married to her. A gentleman. A gentleman protects the virtue of a woman whether he's married to her or not. A gentleman protects the virtue of a woman whether he's married to her or not. I've had occasionally, my wife and I have some have standards. I think they're common sense. We have standards about men and ladies uh, who aren't our spouses and being alone with them and so forth. Uh, if a woman is of an age where there could be a question of whether or not it's appropriate or whether or not if there could be an accusation of impropriety, then we're just really careful not to be alone with the other, one with the other, my wife and I are. It's amazing how common sense that should be, but how sometimes you get criticized for that. I had, uh, I had a lady this, this past year got really angry with me because she called me for counsel and I redirected her to my wife. Said, you know, she said, Well, why won't you talk to me? You know, and I said, Well, my wife can do a better job. If you, if you want help, she can help you. Uh, well, she's not the pastor, you are. Well, she's the pastor's <coughs> wife, and uh, she's, she's the right person for it. And after we finally got through all these, well, nothing's going on between us, I said, No, nothing is going to go on between us. You know, it's not going to happen. Uh, if you have those standards, if those are your standards, 
it becomes a lot more difficult for somebody to falsely accuse you of something. People know that that's the deal, that's the situation. Also, it helps to protect you from something, and David certainly did not have a standard to keep himself from something. Let's talk about ladies. Let's talk about the ladies in our story for a minute. Uh, Bathsheba and uh, Ruth. Draw some contrast. <clears throat> Bathsheba and Ruth. Draw some contrast. Yes. I'm going to say that Beth, well, Bathsheba went out in, in public to, because uh, I presume they had public baths at that time. She was Let's just say let's just say she wasn't she wasn't properly clothed. Yeah, she uh do, do you see any resistance on the part of Bathsheba in this scenario? She wasn't faithful. She didn't cry out. Yeah. When they're in a city, you're supposed to cry out. Yeah. That's what the law said. So what do you what, cry out with? with? You're supposed to say help. You know, this person is taking unfair advantage of me. So the law didn't punish someone who was out in the country, um, didn't punish the woman if she was out in the country because no one could hear her cry out. But they did punish the woman in a city because she should have cried out, someone should have hurt her. And she, by not crying out, she's, <clears throat> she's sharing in the guilt. Okay, so Andrew says she certainly didn't have modesty. In other words, she was very, very sexual about what she, about exposing, the way she exposed herself. Yes, ma'am. It could be also that since everybody was supposed to be out in the field uh, doing the ammon or whatever, she presumed nobody was around. Could be, but she sent a private message to David saying I'm with child. She didn't call her husband. She sent to David said, hey, I'm pregnant. So there was a relationship between the two of them. She had access to David that uh, she shouldn't have had. So I, I don't buy that. In other words, None if a woman is faithful... Well, I'm sorry? None of this was called worse. Yeah. No, I, you don't see it being that way. Uh, <laughs> she married David after she was co-conspirator to her husband's murder and um, got promises from him about Solomon being king of Israel. So it wasn't a, this was a bad thing, should have never happened, we're ashamed and we're going to go our separate ways. It's a, this is a bad thing, we're going to cover up and make it work. First the baby died. Well, first the baby died, but uh, that didn't end the relationship. <clears throat> Um, can you understand David here? Can you understand Bathsheba? Can you understand him? Yeah. Because that's they, they, they lived in bodies of sin and they had lust of the flesh. My friend, a man, a Christian gentleman is a man who controls his flesh. I'm going to just make a statement here. You may have at the stage in life you're at, you may have a history, but unless you own the truths about your past, your children are destined to repeat the same evil in your history. In other words, the reason we're talking about these things isn't to say, well, you know, we're all perfect. Nobody's ever done wrong here. But the reality of it is, is that you are a terrible person if you can't teach somebody something that you learned yourself the hard way. Or if you can't teach somebody something that caused you deep pain or hurt someone else, and you can't say this is right, this is wrong. This is important for ourselves as believers. The world would have you to believe until things go wrong that everything is completely normal. Anybody read uh, what Eric Trump said about his dad? I think it was yesterday. <coughs> what did he say? Come on, folks. This is, I mean, it wasn't these words, but come on, folks. This kind of, this is normal. This kind of thing, this kind of thing is normal. You know, I mean, what my dad said, yeah. 
not appropriate in public, but it happens. You say we all do it. Basically. Yeah, basically say we all do it. And now I just lost a lot of respect for Eric. <laughs> because the fact of the matter is, men, hear me now, not all men are perverts. And not all men verbalize disgusting things. And not all men do whatever they can get away with. And um, this man, Boaz, is a good example of that. Boaz could have been... Do you think Boaz was just... You know, he couldn't find anyone until he found a foreign girl that couldn't speak the language and so she needed someone. She married him. She settled for an older guy. He said, blessed be you. You're not out looking for young men, old or rich. In other words, what Ruth was looking for was a relationship with a person and what Boaz was looking for was a relationship with a person. Now you tell me what was attractive about Ruth. Her spirit. What? Her spirit. I think she was physically attractive. Well, yeah, yes. Okay. Also, I think that she was... The fact... What did, Nick, what did Boaz say about what he'd heard about Ruth? He said, I heard about you. When he found out who she was, what did he hear about her? But she left her own country and left her own parents. That was it, basically. Why did she leave her country and parents, though? To be with um, her mother-in-law. To be with her mother-in-law, why? She was Trusting the Lord. When her mother-in-law said, stay here, go back, go back to what? Your <clears throat> idols. Go back to your idols, go back to your God. Do you think that a woman who was described who described herself as bitter was such a lovely mother-in-law <laughs> that Ruth just couldn't imagine a separation? No. I think not. I think the attraction in Naomi was that Ruth knew she worshipped the true God. I mean, what the attraction in Naomi for Ruth was that she knew that Naomi worshipped the true God. In other words, there is about Ruth, hey, your God will be my God, your people will be my people, Desire. In other words, she desired God's blessing in her life, and I believe that was the greatest attraction. When Boaz said, well, let's look at it specifically in the text. Um, in verse 11, Boaz said, It hath, been, it hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done to thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore, and here's his blessing thou on her. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. The beauty of Ruth was that she loved God and trusted God. And Boaz said, you know, it's one thing, you know, for everybody here to be born Jewish, to be born Israelite, but it's another thing for somebody to love God and have faith and trust in God. In other words, Boaz was some man to appreciate that Ruth loved God. Now here's a sad contrast, isn't there? Because we're contrasting Boaz with the man who was the psalmist who wrote of the intimacy of a relationship with God like no one in history. We cannot say that David did not know who God was. But there's a big difference between Boaz and his application of what he knew about God and David and his application about what he knew of God. Now keep in mind, David came later, not before. We didn't have the Psalms. Boaz didn't have the Psalms. But I wonder a little bit about David's introduction to who God was, if his deep understanding of who God was didn't come from a heritage from his great-grandfather and his great-grandmother, Boaz and Ruth. There's a big difference, though, in their character, isn't there? And men, I want to say to you that biblical masculinity means acting like a man, but it means more than that. It means being a man with character. And ladies, I want to say to you that biblical femininity is more than just acting like a woman, but is acting like a woman with character. Ruth is not trying to attract Boaz with her beauty. She's not trying to seduce or win Boaz at all. It's not until she...
woman tells Naomi about the name of the man in whose field she gleaned, Naomi, she comes home and she's got her hands full, which is quite a bit. Enough to make several loaves of bread. It's not much, but it's a lot. They were on the foraging diet. <laughs> she comes home and she's got a... And Naomi says, why? How'd you do that? Well, I, I got in the field of a guy and, uh, you know, he, he, he told me, don't go draw water. The young men get water and you, you drink the water the young men draw. That's what men are for, is pulling up water and lifting heavy things. My young men have done that, so don't, don't you go and draw water, just help yourself. And I've told the men, you know, don't bother you. So you just feel free to, you know, go wherever you want to go and they'll stay out of your way. And uh, they would have stayed out. I, oh, I tell you, Boaz was such a man, I think, if his young, his young men would have dreamt of harming a woman in his field or making a lewd comment or saying something or locker room talk, if you will. Not in, Obed, not in Boaz's field. Not happening. He's a real man. And um, so Ruth comes home. She tells Naomi, yeah, well, this guy, you know, Boaz. Boaz, Boaz, yeah. Boaz, he's a relative. We're related to him. He's next. Hey. All of a sudden, this bitter woman with no hope in the world says, oh, you could marry him. He's available. You know, I mean, what's the chance of going to somebody who is a mighty man of wealth who isn't who is you know single I mean the mighty men of wealth are taken and you know uh, but not Boaz all right let's let's think about this for a second I want to point out something here hard to get isn't the way to phrase it but valued ought to be the way to put it I don't think Ruth is playing hard to get here. I don't think Boaz is playing hard to get. But Boaz is not a young man and he's still single. Why? Providence. Providence. I'm talking about his personal character, though. Providence works with your personal character. You know? Is it because he couldn't, you know, he's just, I mean, he's just so ugly? No, I'm sorry, but uh, it doesn't work like that. Ugly guys get married if they got money. I was going to say, he didn't have all the Jewish features either. How do you know that? Because his mother was Canaanite or from Jericho. Okay, let's talk about Jewish features for a minute. What do Jewish people look like? Usually black hair, long nose. What about the blonde haired ones, though? I'm what about the Ashkenazi? Them. All the Europeans who are a majority of Jews. Most, most Jews are light-featured, uh, but, but there's dark-featured, there's light-featured. Uh, the, you go in a lot into talking about Jewish, but the whole idea of Jewish people looking Jewish is kind of a misnomer, actually. Um, all Jewish people look like other Jewish people, but they all look differently. Uh, there's dark-skinned ones that look uh, Middle Eastern, and there are the Ashkenazi Jews, which look European. But I, I think to say that, you know, that he didn't get married because he was ugly. Let's be real, he had money. <laughs> he could have gotten married. Why was Boaz not... I, I reject that. I don't, think was, I don't think it was his looks. Uh, I always say, I don't think he was single because of his looks. And the proof of it is all the men in here that are married. <laughs> looks aren't what you need. Yes? I think that he was uh, waiting on a woman of God's choice, or a godly woman. Yeah, he wanted a godly woman. Of course, Boaz wasn't willing to be married to a person of the feminine gender. Boaz wanted a wife. It's interesting because in contrast to Canaanite culture, he wanted a wife who was a person. Not a wife who was an object, but a wife who was a person. Whereas who Ruth was was more important to Boaz than what she looked like, and I fully believe that. Let's talk about who she was again. Who was she? What was attractive about Ruth? <clears throat> she really came from a family of losers. Right? I mean, I'm sorry, but her parents, her family, her father's house were a bunch of Moabitish idolaters, and they have an incestuous history. Right? Moabs, or Lot's, 
daughters had children with Lot. That's about as sordid a history as you can have. Okay, that's her dad's side of the family, her, her parents' side of the family. And then her in-law's side of the family, her Naomi's boys were named Mahon and Kilion, which means weak or sickly and pining. So we, we, I will say here that she didn't evidently care about the looks of the man that she married, Mrs. Dons. And she didn't marry muscle men, and they didn't, they didn't survive. They were little, little scrawny, you know, whatevers. And they died. <laughs> okay. Men, it, it, the sooner you realize that ladies don't marry you for looks, the better off you'll be. Now, you shouldn't stink or smell. I mean, there can be things that are put-offs. You know, if she can't stand being in your presence because it's that offensive, well, that's a little bit of a problem. So wear a mask. You know, they got a lot of them, you know, right now. But just don't stink. That's, that's the rule for biblical masculinity. A masculine man sweats, he smells, and he showers. Those are just, you know, that's what you do about that. And a man that showers, um, he'll be all right. Okay, so Ruth didn't go for looks. And Boaz didn't go for looks either. That's what I would say, wouldn't you? What was the attraction between the two of them? Person. A gentleman is interested in a lady for who she is, not for what she represents or what she looks like. And a lady is interested in a gentleman for who he is and not for what he represents or what he looks like. The old how you get them is how you keep them thing is kind of true. And uh, Boaz didn't just want a good-looking girl. Boaz wanted a wife. That's pretty neat. Do you get the idea that these two were fast friends? It's interesting how close Naomi was in this whole thing. When that baby was born, who grabbed the baby? Naomi said, that's mine. <laughs> it's my grandbaby. And she took him and nursed him and took care of of uh, Obed. In other words, this is a family affair. Well, how must Boaz, I keep saying Obed, how must Boaz have treated his mother-in-law? Yeah, you think he cracked mother-in-law jokes? No, he didn't. He honored his mother-in-law. She evidently had a part in their household. She was part of the house. She was part of the deal. A man who respects a woman for who she is marries her and everybody she knows. A woman, and I, by that I don't mean he marries, but I mean he, he doesn't try to isolate her, doesn't try to pull her away, withdraw her, or keep her from her family. He marries the family. Uh, a woman who respects a man for who he is does the same. In other words, there's a mutual respect here. My friend, I just have to say that I believe that these are distinctives. Not in this generation, not in the past generation, not in the future generation, but in every generation distinguished between a biblical man and a masculine man, a biblically masculine man and a biblically feminine woman. It's how you treat people how you behave toward people. One of the distinctives that we see is a really unfortunate contrast between David and Bathsheba, the way they viewed each other, the way they treated each other, and there was really a sexual relationship. And between Boaz and Ruth and the way they treated each other, which is a honorable relationship. Ladies, you don't want any part of a man that sees you only for what you look like. Or what you have. And man, you don't want any part of a woman who sees you for what you look like or what you have. And Ruth got lucky. <laughs> she got a rich guy. But the great thing about Boaz wasn't that he was rich. The great thing about Boaz was the kind of a man he was. And the great thing about Ruth wasn't obviously that she married a sickly or pining fellow and that she was from 
you know, that she was a Moabitess, and everybody knows the Moab Moabitesses were beautiful. The great thing about Ruth was that she chose God. And she was faithful. Faithful to her mother-in-law. Faithful to God. And Boaz said, you know, if she'll be faithful to Naomi, and she'll be faithful to God, that's the kind of lady I'd like to be married to. What a relationship. Most beautiful, most beautiful man and woman relationship in the scripture. You could read Song of Solomon, you look at Solomon and his wife in, in uh, Song of Solomon, but it's always dimmed by the realization that she wasn't his one and only. Mm -hmm. But for Boaz and for Ruth, you look at this relationship, and you realize that everything in their relationship was pure, it was right, it was desirable. And really, each of them is a good representative for what a man ought to be and what a woman ought to be. So I hope you're helped by it, and I uh, hope that's a good conclusion. We've been looking at the last several weeks. Father, we do thank you for what you've taught us, and I pray that you would help us desire, desire these things. Lord, every one of these character traits, either of David or of Boaz, can represent any individual who makes choices about what kind of a person they're going to be. And I pray that you would help us to realize this and make these decisions based on it. We pray in Jesus' name for your help. Amen. 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 Amen.